Thank you, Lord. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. I can, I can, we can preach while people pray, amen? I believe that. That's good. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to go ahead, and we're just going to take some time. But look, what happened was yesterday I was driving to work, and I had already written a particular message. But while I was driving, I just felt led to put on some music. I don't really listen to music very much. And when I did, I actually played this particular song, and I didn't really plan on anybody playing it at first. Um, but it was whenever I was listening to the song itself that I began to, uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I felt I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak to me, right place at the right time. Right place at the right time. And so that's the title of my message this morning, Right Place at the Right Time. Now, I don't know if you could understand all of the words. I wish we would have had the words that we could have put on the screen. But basically, like he was explaining, that this song is actually being written from the perspective of the thief that was on the cross next to Jesus. And basically, the thief that was on the cross next to Jesus, there were actually two of them. Jesus was crucified in between two thieves. And the Bible teaches us that something happened in the life of one of those thieves throughout, throughout the process of this crucifixion. And basically, in the song, he's just saying, listen, I'm a thief and I'm a murderer. And, and, he, and he's saying, who is this man on the side of me? They say that he's the king of the Jews. Uh, and, and, and he's saying that the people out there did not believe that he was the Messiah. But he said, but this is what the song says, but somehow, I'll, 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 in the imagination or the heart of a man, when he hears that title, right place at the right time, he may daydream. He may daydream with his, seeing his toes in the sugary white sands of Destin Beach. He might daydream that he's on the beach and that his face is being massaged by a warm summer breeze. He might imagine himself on the mountain of an Ozark mountaintop looking down into a lush green valley. And he may think that, that after all, we're talking about right place at the right time. So we would imagine all of these abundant blessings and all of these beautiful places that we could be and we could sit back and say, man, I'm at the right place at the right time. And, you know, it's not, I want you to know that it is God's intention that you and I would be able to enjoy the beautiful creation that he's given us. I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't go on a vacation. That's not the point I'm trying to make. But I do not believe that God is okay. As a matter of fact, I believe he is opposed to the mindset that only understands that the right place at the right time has to be a beautiful place always to the naked eye or that it has to be a bountiful blessing to the naked eye. Because sometimes the lowest valleys in our lives end up being the right place at the right time. The man of Gadara, the, the man of Ga the Gadarenes that was demon-possessed and living in the tombs, when Jesus showed up, the worst place of his life turned into the right place at the right time. Amen? The Samaritan woman... Five failed marriages and living in adultery, sad, all alone at the well, ostracized from the community, then Jesus shows up. And the state of loneliness becomes the right place at the right time. You got your own story, but me in a bar room after 12 years of Christianity and the death of my sister, that dark, smelly place for me that night became the right place at the right time. What about you? What about you and your heart and in your life? Where is the worst place that you've ever been? What is the worst time of your life? But then my next question would be this. Was the worst place and time of your life part of the reason that got you saved or part of the reason that brought you into the house of God? Because if it was, that place was really the right place at the right time. With that in mind, I just want us to consider the thief that was nailed on the cross on the side of Jesus. I want to consider the pure misery. You know, look, scientists, uh, scientists, and actually one, one of my friends wrote, was, did some study, and he gave me his paperwork about the cross and about the crucifixion of what he was studying. He wanted me to review it. And I think that maybe somehow that influenced me about three weeks ago as I was reading this. 
that scientists and doctors alike have studied the torture of the Roman cross. Many have said that there's really not a more agonizing death that anyone could die. Death is ultimately caused through asphyxiation. As the weight of the body hangs down, the diaphragm can't work to bring air into the lungs. It's not, it's not blood loss from the nails that causes the death. You know, as a matter of fact, that little bit of amount of blood loss really wouldn't cause death to anybody. I suppose, I suppose that maybe in some times and in certain situations, they might would accidentally nick the radial artery as they were nailing. But, but, usually, but to be perfectly honest with you, the, the Roman Empire would have really considered crucifixion an art, as crazy as that sounds, the art of torture by evil and cruel men. If we, if we monitor throughout the ages, the forms of torture that the hearts of evil, wicked men have come up with in order to cause humanity to go the way that they want them to go, that we, we, would, we would just be blown away by that. But that's exactly what the crucifixion was. It was the art of torture that was developed by the Roman Empire, and it was purpose was to slowly kill its victims. It was intended that they would die a slow and a painful death. Because you see, part of the purpose of torture is so that the citizens will be quelled, that they will be squashed and not willing to revolt and not willing to rise up. The victims would be lined up on main roads that led into cities so that the passerbys would have to walk by the pain and the agony and see with their own eyes the anguish being endured and hear with their own ears the moans and the groans and the whimpers of the person that was being crucified. Yet after a while, maybe not much could really even be heard anymore because see, the weight of the body would become weakened. The weight of the body would become weakened with time and no longer could it be lifted up while they were hanging on the cross and and not even strong enough to take in enough breath to even really vibrate their vocal cords. And at that point, I can assure you, the victim would want to die. But death couldn't come fast enough. Instead, they would slowly asphyxiate and at some point become so weak that they couldn't even muster one more breath and then they would slip into eternity. What a horrible death. What a tragic story. Pain and agony and despair. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy if I had a worst enemy. But for the thief that I'm talking about, there was not a better place that he could have been. You got to hear me this morning when I'm talking to you. For that thief that was hanging on that cross, there was not a better place, a better time that he could have ever been. This was the best place of his life. I want you to consider his place and his timing. The timing. I want you to just think about this for a second. One day sooner, one day later, he would have been dead and he would have never seen Jesus. Just think about that. One day sooner, had he been crucified, one day after, he would have never seen Jesus. He would have never experienced this opportunity. What about the place? One to two crosses over. What are you talking about, preacher? Had he had there just been one more criminal in between him and Jesus, he may not have experienced the things that transpired during that period of time, and it might not have influenced him like he was had he been one crossover. Perfect place, perfect time. Hallelujah. No, he was in the right place at the right time. And the more I think about it, I realize now it was exactly planned by God. God wanted you and I to have reference and documentation of the ministry of Jesus. That to the very end, even with the very last breath, he was all about doing his father's will. Just like the right place for the Samaritan woman was the well, the right place for this thief was hanging on the cross next to Jesus, right where he could get a close-up visual of the fruit of the Spirit on display before him. Before his very eyes, he watched the fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to talk to you because, look, I feel like this was revelation for me. I've never seen this before. 65 years before Paul would write about the fruit of the Spirit to the churches of Galatia, Jesus would display it for all to see while he hung on the cross. Have you ever noticed how you act when you uh, get irritated? (laughs) 
I mean, have you ever, I mean, have you taken the time as a believer yet? Are you a believer? If you're not a believer, you can become a believer. But first of all, what does it mean to be a believer? It means you're going to have to believe that, first of all, you're a sinner and you need a savior. And if you walked up in this house this morning thinking you don't need a savior, you walked into the wrong house, my friend. Because look, we're all born of Adam and we're all born in sin. And I don't care how good of a person that you try to be, you will never be good enough in order to enter into the presence of the Lord. That's why God the Father had to bankrupt heaven of its most prized possession and send his precious only begotten son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for sin. So I hope this morning, listen, if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can invite him into your heart right now. And he will, he will do a work on the inside of your life. And listen, once you become a believer and you invite Christ into your heart, you'll never be the same. Oh, you'll go through seasons. You'll go through mountaintops and valleys. You'll go on a little roller coaster ride. You'll go through some wilderness experiences. But the question is, will you continue to stay the course and continue to serve him and continue to hold on, amen, to hold on to the Lord? And if you will, he will grow you up and he will bring you through the process of the journey and he will teach you his ways. And once the Holy Spirit's living in you, that's the question that I really started with. Have you ever noticed how you act when you're irritated? Because see, if you're not born again, you won't even realize it. If you're not born again, you may not even realize that you're, how you're acting. Is, is that okay if I say that? <laughs> is that okay? Because if you're not born again and the Holy Spirit's not living in you, then you may think that your behavior is perfectly acceptable. I mean, after all, again, the girl did leave my pickles off the cheeseburger at Burger King, even though I asked her three times, make sure my pickles are either on or off the hamburger. And now the next thing you know, I'm so frustrated over pickles that somebody cuts me off in line and I'm honking the horn. And then it's some dude that he's irritated too. And the next thing you know, he's, you know, cussing and fussing and he's probably ready to fight. The next thing you know, a bad day just got real, real bad. It's not God's will for you and I to be living that way. It's not God's will for you and I to be acting that way. It's not God's will for his people called by his name to feel so irritated in their spirit. You know, when things aren't going our way in life, how do we treat other people? I can tell you that if you ever see me act a fool, and you may have already, and you may in the future, I hope not, but you might. If you ever see me act a fool, I can tell you more than likely I'm stressed with a bunch of things. There's a whole lot of stuff because I mean, look, by the grace of God, because I'm aware of this and I want to live right. It don't mean I always do, but I can tell you I'm very aware of this. I'm very aware of how my personality can be, how I can become very irritated. And I'm very aware of how I can talk to other people. I don't like that part about me. But look, sometimes it gets even worse. Like you would think, man, I, that's my pastor. I mean, it hadn't happened many times lately. I don't think. It happened the other day. I'm going to be transparent. I was going through some stuff with my daughter. Well, it was whenever I asked all y'all to pray a while back. And I ended up, well, I'm just going to say it like it is. I, went, I brought her to a hospital for whatever reason. And I walk in there. And I'm on the phone talking to somebody. And I guess I was talking kind of loud because I'm a loud guy. I w I'm willing to admit that. And when I did, this guy was in the weight room. I hope y'all don't hate me after I tell y'all this. This guy was in the weight room. And he said, shh. And he looked at me like I was crazy. I said, excuse me, sir? I said, did you just shush me? I said, oh, no, sir, you don't shush me. No, you don't. Don't shush me. Do you understand what I'm saying? Ma'am, please. I'm talking to your husband right now. Sir, don't shush me. And then I walked outside. I know, isn't that so fleshly, so irritated, so carnal, ooh, ugly. I ain't done nothing like that in a long time, my friend. And I'm not trying to make excuses for it. I know, I was, I was up to here with it. And it wasn't godly at all. I walked outside, I finished that phone call, and the Lord's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what in the world are you doing? Is that okay? No, I don't think so. So you know me, <laughs> goober boy over here. I walk back up in the ER, and I'll go sit down, and I said, sir, first of all, I got to let you know I'm a pastor. <laughs> I know I did not just act like one, even a little bit, but I wanted to come in here and say to you that I'm sorry because I didn't act the way I should have acted. And I would imagine that you're going through some things and I don't know if it would be okay if I tried to pray with you real quick. And he's like, yeah, 
That's fine. That'd be great. And he said, I'm sorry, too, because I shouldn't. I said, no, it's all good, dude. So anyway, I was able to pray with him. So in that instance, Robert, yes, I was able to go back by the grace of God and tell this man about my Jesus. I'm thinking about Robert in the back of my head. Can you go back and can you tell this man about your Jesus? God arranged it to where I could. Now, whether or not he really received from the prayer, I don't know. But by the grace of God. My point is, is this. Have you ever been irritated before? Have you ever slipped back off into your flesh? Have you ever felt the carnality and the frustration rise up and then you just like release it and you let it out and then the next thing you know, it's like, oh my gosh, where did that come from? So if you see me act the fool, there's probably something going on in my life, but I'm here to tell you that that's not a good reason. Because see, it's in those times that the fruit of the Spirit wants to reveal itself. See, it's in those times when we're going through the worst times that God wants to prove himself. He wants to show up in our heart and in our lives, and he wants to show us, my God is greater. Amen? My God is stronger. That was that first song they sang. I don't even know all the words, but you get the point. My God is greater than my irritation. My God is greater than my stressful event. My God is greater than the fall of man upon this earth. The God that I serve is the God of glory. He is the king of the universe. He will change people's hearts and lives. He will set them free from addiction and bondage. He will put hope Hope and love and compassion in our hearts. Jesus, as he's literally dying, is simultaneously producing the fruit of the Spirit. I never really saw it exactly like this before. How can you be in any worse situation ever than this? And there he is producing the Spirit's fruit. <laughs> This is so deep for me. And I mean, and maybe it won't be that deep for you. I don't know, but this is so deep because what's happening to me is I'm going through all of this is that I'm seeing that Jesus is displaying the fruit of the Spirit openly at the worst time of his humanity. One example real quick, and I'll say it again. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That may not be a big deal to you, but as he's dying, the death of the cross... See, and and, and look, this was a major revelation for me right here. He's dying the death of the cross while displaying the fruit of the Spirit. And while I'm reading this and writing it as I lay in my bed at night, I'm reminded that in order for me to ever display the fruit of the Spirit, I too will have to die the death of the cross. I will have to become one with him in his crucifixion. I will have to by faith, die to the old man that I was, and I will have to, the old man will have to be buried with Christ, and a new man will have to be, spiritually speaking, resurrected to newness of life. I need you to understand, you may not understand all of the teachings of the Bible, and that's understandable. Look, it's a process. It's a long journey. But I want you to understand this, is this. Holiness and learning the journey of Christianity is exactly that. It's a journey. It's a process. But if a person is not willing to submit themselves to the will of God, if a person is not willing to get up and to continue to follow the Lord, then that person will not be able to grow. I say this because all of these things, because look, the thief is watching all of this. I want you to understand that. He's seeing it all play out in front of him, and it begins to slowly affect him. I have preached on this concept before, but I don't think I've ever seen it quite as clearly as what I did this time. So the thief is seeing all of this stuff play out before him. So then my next question is, what did he see? And let's go ahead and read a few of these verses out of Matthew right here. It says, and over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews. So that by itself, you got to understand, they put the plaque up there. And, you know, it's difficult for you and I maybe to be able to imagine the actual context of what's going on. Like if we were able to see a video of it, it might help us to see. But you do understand there's people talking. And again, I made the point that they would put those, the, the people dying on the cross, they would line them up on the road that leads into the city. And so travelers that are coming by can see this as they enter in. And part of it is to remind them at least at this time that Rome is in control that Caesar is the boss and if you don't comply with his rules see Rome's over here saying this we want to provide a good society for you 
We want to provide a good civilization. We want people to be able to prosper. We're going to make you roads. We're going to do all of these things. Yes, we're going to tax you till you can't hardly see straight because Caesar needs his money. But look, as long as you comply with the rules of the world, you will be protected. But if you don't, this is what your lot in life is. And so if you can imagine people walking up and down the street, if you can imagine there's probably a crowd of people because by now Jesus' name is very popular. And so many people would know that he had already been prosecuted, persecuted, whatever you want to call it. And they would say, Jesus of Nazareth, the teacher, he's hanging on the cross. Let's go see this. I would imagine that there was a pretty significant crowd out there that day. And, and, and they got a plaque up there that says, Jesus, King of the Jews. So do you not imagine that people are saying that? Look at that. Look at that plaque right there. And look, in one of the Gospels, it says that Pontius Pilate made him put it in three different languages so that all the travelers could see. And you don't imagine, look, look at that one. Look at that plaque up there. They say the King of the Jews. Well, I wonder why they got that up there. This is a king? Does that look like a king right here? And, and then it goes on to say this, then two robbers, the King James says, two thieves were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Look at this. Those who passed by derided him. The King James Version says they reviled him. They wagged their heads. And this is what they said. You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. It says those that pass by, you see, I see this as kind of like just your normal person in the world, traveling from another city to Jerusalem. They're walking by, they see the plaque, they hear the, the, the crowd and what they're saying, and they say, oh, you say you're the king of the Jews. You say you're gonna rebuild the temple and you can't even pull yourself. And look, it says they're wagging their head. Oh, look at you, shame, shame, shame. Look at you, hanging up there naked, bleeding and sweating all over the place. Look at you, can't even breathe. Oh, you so big and strong. Look at you dying on a cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and then we will believe in him. You know, the other day we were here for prayer. By the way, we've been doing a lot of praying in the church. I want to invite everybody to come out. I think we're going to try to start posting it on our little church's Facebook page, maybe come up with a sign. I mean, they're praying a lot over here, times that I can't even make it. So I'm just letting you know that there's a good chance if you see some cars in the parking lot, at least parked on this side, that you could probably just walk in and start praying with people. That happened to me yesterday with Mary and Cimarron. That was a beautiful, for me it was anyway. I was only able to come for about 40 minutes, but it just like flowed right in and then flowed out. Amen. It was good. We want prayer. Amen. Amen. So he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. And you know, the reason that I even thought about that was because one of the other days when we were talking, Mary said, so what, it, she said something like, what would be your definition of a spirit of religion? And so I tried to like explain what I would say. I mean, I'm sure she had it in her mind what she would think. But I think that this is it right here. <laughs> the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and then we will believe in him. Now, what does that spirit look like if it jumps on you? What does that spirit look like if it jumps on me? We're probably not saying that about Jesus, but we might say, if we're not careful, something like, I told them so. I told them. I warned them, but they wouldn't listen to me. Now, listen, everything you just said may be completely true. You might have warned them. You might have told them, and they might have gone ahead and forged forward and opened their own doors, and now they find themselves in bondage. But this is the thing. You got to check what this is feeling right there. You got to check and see what you're feeling right here. Because if there's even a little symbol or hint of you taking joy in the fact that you were right and somebody else was wrong, you, my friend, have gotten a little tincture, a little piece of a spirit of religion that's hanging on your back. Because in no way, shape, or form should you find any joy or any happiness that you were right at the expense of another person. 
And instead, your heart should be broken. My heart should be broken for that person. Because look, if we become hard in our hearts towards these people, then we're no longer helping them and instead we're hurting them. And it's not the fruit of the spirit that is coming out of us. I hope that makes sense. That's just one little simple concept right there. And how do you know so well, preacher? (laughs) Because I myself have been tainted by a spirit of religion. Lord, help us. Thank you, Jesus. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Look at that. The two thieves on the cross on either side of him, you got the world passing by, wagging their head, laughing. You can't even save yourself. How are you going to save anybody else? You got the chief priest walking by saying, same thing. Why don't you come down off that cross? If you can save yourself, then we'll believe you. And you have even the two thieves, the two criminals saying the same thing. They're reviling Jesus. They're, they're really, some of the words that are being used here is they're blaspheming him. They're mocking him. They're laughing at him. You, you, do you realize that if you truly give your heart to the Lord, people are going to probably mock you? People are going to probably persecute you? Oh, if you take a stand for Jesus, like I'm not talking about, look, and when I say this, I mean it with all sincerity and purity of heart. We've been praying for other churches in the area. I'm not even trying to talk about other. I'm just talking about the condition of the church. I preached on that last time, right? How many times do people sitting in churches think they got something figured out? You, look, if you ever walk into a church that is bound by a spirit of religion, okay, you're going to know what I'm talking about because you will sense it coming off of the people. And I hope and pray that the people of this church are not that way. I hope and pray that when people walk through the doors of this church that they can feel the love of the Lord and that they're not ignored, they're not buffeted, they're not, you know, looked down upon, but that instead they can feel the true love of God. Amen. And, and, the, and these thieves, in the same way, I just want you to see this. At this point in time, both of these thieves... These thieves are joining in and harassing the Lord. Now, I want to go ahead and I'm going to transition over here to Luke chapter 23, verse 39. And it says, one of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him saying, do you not fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done no wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Now listen, this is way too much for my brain to be able to properly organize. But I want you to understand that so many times the things that God is doing on the earth, we're expecting, we're, sometimes we're expecting some kind of an explosion to happen. And listen, God's all about explosions. But what I'm trying to say is this, sometimes it's these little bitty things that God's doing and you know in your heart and in your spirit that God manufactured that situation specifically for you, specifically for someone else to get them in the right place at the right time so that he could minister to them, so that he could set them free so that he could save their soul. Something happened to this thief. Now, the scripture, I'm pretty, I'm I'm convinced on this. Look, commentators go back and forth. People have questioned the timing of the various gospels and whatnot. But essentially, the idea is the third hour would have been nine o'clock in the morning and the sixth hour would have been three o'clock in the afternoon. And those are the times of the morning and and the evening sacrifice. The idea is that Jesus would have been nailed on the cross somewhere right around the time of the morning sacrifice. And the idea is that Jesus would have been, would have died somewhere around the time of the evening sacrifice. Six hours. Somewhere around six hours. About in the middle of all of that, the whole sky turns dark. And it's really ominous. In the midst of this six hours, so much is happening And this thief is sitting there and he's observing all of these things that are transpiring and that are taking place. And that was really one of the first things 
that I was trying to bring out is this, is that that first word that, that Jesus spoke right here in Luke 23, verse 34. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. So there they were, gambling for Jesus' clothing at the foot of the cross. Now, now, what I want you to see here is this. I want you to look at this from the thief's perspective. I mean, can you imagine how, like, when you're so irritated and you're so angry, and look, and if you're a criminal, because look, I, I'm not happy to admit it, but I've been a criminal. I've been so bound up in sin before, so bound up in alcohol and drugs before, so bound up in lust, thievery, robbery, Am I happy to, like, I done paid my dues to the nursing board. They ain't coming back for no more. I can sit here and tell you the truth. That's what I came from. Thievery, robbery, anger. And look, can I, authority? Oh, I was disgusted with authority. I can remember one time coming back out of, out of a night of drunkenness and getting in a fight with somebody and the police in Lafayette catching me in a field. And what do I do instead of saying, yes, sir, I'm sorry? I start hollering and cussing at them. And the next thing you know, they take their billy clubs out and they're beating the mess out of me. And the whole time, I'm still screaming and fighting and rebelling the whole time, even once they got me cuffed in the station, still acting like a fool. Going, going through all of these things. And I can just imagine these thieves on the cross in the very beginning when they still got a little bit of strength and they can still pull themselves up a little bit and they can get a little bit of air in their lungs and they can vibrate them vocal cords screaming and cursing and angry at the Roman Empire, angry at the people that are laughing on the ground, angry at everybody, so frustrated because nothing's going their way. And then they just become angry at the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. How are you going to say you're going to save people and you're over here nailing to a cross and you can't even get yourself down. And then Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And he sees that. I don't know if that was the first thing that he heard that caught his attention. But surely if you're hanging on a cross and you see the passerbys that are laughing and scoffing and mocking and you see the chief priest laughing and you realize that you yourself was railing on him. And then all of a sudden you hear, probably not even a real loud word, but you hear it come out of his lips. He's praying to the Father and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Was that the first thing that caught his attention? I mean, did he see something? He's like, whoa, what was that? What did he just say? Did he just say, Father, forgive them? Because that's a whole lot different than I would have expected. You see, some of these things that I'm talking to you about, they might not be legit, straight up fruits of the Spirit, but what I'm trying to say is if they're not fruit of the Spirit listed in the book of Galatians, they're definitely attributes of the Spirit, like what you would experience or what you would expect. And when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, one of the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, and we've talked about that a lot in this church, and the reason that we talk about it a lot in this church is because we all struggle with it. Because long-suffering specifically talks about patience in relationships with other human beings. Patience itself is talking about endurance in situations. Long-suffering is talking about endurance or patience in relationships. What does that mean? That means, and I'm preaching to the preacher, that if you get on my nerves, God's going to reveal to me that even though you get on my nerves, my job is to trust God that he will do a work in my heart so that I can love you. Because it's important that I love you. And it's important that my heart stays soft towards you. Why? Because if my heart doesn't stay soft towards you, I'm not going to pray for you. And if I don't pray for you, then, then uh, first of all, I'm out of God's will because I'm not acting like my master. But secondly, I'm not inviting the Holy Spirit to do a work in your heart and in your life. So long-suffering Jesus is long-suffering with these people in spite of the fact that they're mocking him and they're laughing at him. The whole time, if you go and you read the story for yourself, just read Matthew 27, when you go home, it's kind of long. But, and imagine what they're doing to your, to your Jesus. And then in John 19 and 26, let me put that one up here real quick. John 19 and 26, this is another scene from, the, from going on with the cross. And I, I'm imagining that the thief saw this too. Because he's right there. He's stuck. Can't really go anywhere. 
I thought that was so good, Brendan, when you said that when you was preaching the other night. And I know it hit you because you told me later that it just hit you all of a sudden when you said inside of the well, the, the, fi- the fish's belly and he couldn't go anywhere. He was stuck. And he was talking about his situation and how the Lord had gotten him stuck. And I never saw it like that with Jonah. And, and I don't even think Brennan saw it before he said it. But just stuck there. That was good. Like, you can't go nowhere. Like, you're over here trying to run to Joppa. Or you're trying, you're trying to go to Tarshish instead of going to Nineveh. And guess what? God will hem you up, my friend. God will swallow you up in the, be- in the belly of a whale and you can't go nowhere. you stuck. And he's going to bring you to the place where he desires for you to go. Is there any way you could be any more stuck than this man on the cross? I mean, this is pretty stuck right here. He nailed to the cross. He ain't going nowhere. In John 19, 26, when it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. You know, anybody that ever had a good mom, and I had a good mom, man, I'll tell you what. I know, mama, you've been a much better mom than I've been a son, and I'm willing to admit that. My mom used to run me around all over the place. She put up with all my old dumb friends that I figured out that it was a smart thing to hang out with, and ain't none, of them, none of those decisions were ever really very smart. But so if you had a good mom, then, you, then, then it shouldn't be that hard to love your mama, right, is what I'm trying to say. And, and obviously, Jesus loves his mother, and obviously, Jesus loves John. But I'm just trying to say, like, imagine yourself on the cross right then and there, hanging up there for some length of time, people laughing and mocking and deriding you. I mean, it's like, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking that there's a good chance that I'm probably pretty focused on the fact that I'm in pain and I'm hurting you know, and then I'm like, when is my next breath going to come? Like, you understand what I'm getting? Like, have you ever been really hemmed up in a situation where you're in pain like that? I mean, what else are you thinking about other than the pain, right? Do we not all admit that sometimes pain can become so great in our lives, whether it's physical pain or emotional pain, that the only thing that you can think about is that thing that you got going on right there? Yet Jesus, in that moment of time, sees his mother, sees John the Beloved, and and he breaks through and he, he says, hey, <laughs> and he's focused on them yeah. in this worst time of his life. And I think of the fruit of the spirit called kindness because the not it good just to be kind, to be kind to other people, to not be harsh, to not be ugly, to not be irritated. I'm not telling you to fake it till you make it. I'm trying to say when the Holy Spirit is doing the work in your heart and in your life, he's going to produce kindness in us. And and, and out of the kindness of his heart, he sees my mother. She needs to be taken care of. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And the thief is just sitting here, and he's got to be imagining that. Maybe he thinks about his own mom. I don't know what's going on in his head. Maybe he thinks about his own mom. Maybe he realizes how he treated his own mom. I don't know what he's thinking, but what I'm trying to say is that's a fruit of the Spirit. That in the midst of the worst time of his life, he would think about other people. And then in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, these are the last words that Jesus speaks, all of these little instances that I'm talking about. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, some people would say, oh, he, he, he turned his back on God. No. You got to understand what's going on here. And I don't mean to be so redundant. Many of y'all been coming to church here for a long time and you've heard it till you're blue in the face. But look, it was revelation for me the first time I understood it. This is the thing. God the Father did not turn his face away from Jesus because of Jesus' sin. Jesus had no sin. God the Father turned his face away from Jesus because of my sin. It was my sin that was upon the Lord that caused the Father to turn his face from Jesus. Jesus had never felt this before. The Bible says about Jesus that when he was 12 years old, that he was confounding the religious leaders when he spoke about his Father's word. Jesus was full of the word of God. He grew in wisdom and in stature. 
He, he walked with the Father. He was, he, was, he was embodied the Spirit of God. He was embodied the Word of God. He had never once experienced separation from the Father, the Father's presence. He had never experienced that before. He did not know what it felt like, so when he felt it, he knew that it happened. Because, you see, he had been being told, and things were being revealed to him, and, and he knew that, it, that this day was coming. Slowly but surely, if you read the Gospels closely, you begin to realize that God began to show him that he was going to have to die on the cross, that when he went to Jerusalem, that these things were going to happen to him. It became more and more clear as this time approached. And then when it happens... It probably wasn't really exactly what he expected. He didn't probably know. He didn't really know what to expect. Do you understand that? Do y'all understand the humanity aspect of Jesus? It's really important that you do understand that. And let me tell you why it's important that you understand the humanity of Jesus. Because if you only look at the deity of Jesus, then you start to picture in your mind, oh, well, I'm not Jesus. It don't work like that, my friend. Jesus was 100% man and he was 100% God. Jesus, when he walked on earth, the majority of the miracles he performed, at least this is my contention, were not performed as God himself. They were performed as a conduit through which the Holy Spirit moved. As a matter of fact, some people may not agree with this, but I believe that the one time that the deity of our Lord really shone through was when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Whenever he turned white and his clothing became white as fuller soap. Listen, what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that Jesus' ministry on earth was not to be God on earth. Did, hold on, let's be careful here. Preacher, sound like he's starting to preach heresy. No, hold on. What I'm trying to tell you is, is this, did God sin? Did God sin? No, God did not sin. Uh, can God die? No. What is the wages of sin? Death. Death. So therefore, if the wage is going to be paid, someone got to die. Who's going to die? Can Adam die for the sin of man? No, because Adam is the cause of the fountainhead of all sin for all man. Can Cain die for the sin of man? No. Can Seth die for the sin of man? Can Enoch die for the sin of man? Can blameless Job die for the sin of man? No, because they've all been born of Adam's fallen race, and they've all received in their DNA this thing called sin. Only one God had to become a man to die, and so it is not God that needs to die it's man but it's got to be the right kind of man it's got to be a man without sin because see man was formed that day in the image and likeness of God and in him is no darkness and here's Adam and he's formed of the clay of the dirt before the fall and he's breathed life from the, from the precious spirit of God and in him is life and he becomes a living soul and he has no sin in him but then he transgresses the ways of God and he brings sin into the world and the whole world and the whole earth that we live upon is cursed and the ground begins to produce thorn and thistle. That's why I believe Jesus had a crown of thorns on his head but the ground becomes thorn and thistle because the whole earth is cursed and Romans 8 says, all creation groans and it longs and it waits for the day of redemption when the final day and the final trumpet sounds and God heals it all and the curse is no more and there's no more tear, there's no more crying, there's no more sorrow. And God and Jesus feels it. He feels that that separation, because he had to pay the penalty. He had to pay the ransom, because the wages of sin is death. And he did all that for you. I wish that I could really, really talk you into believing it. I understand that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got to do a work in your heart, because I don't care how passionate I get, and I've seen this before. I'm passionate because God, you know, I'm a passionate person before Jesus. I'm definitely a passionate person now. But then God showed up in my darkest hour. You understand? God showed up in my darkest hour, and I can talk about it, and I can scream it from the rooftop, but if the Holy Spirit doesn't do a work in your heart, you won't understand what I'm trying to say. Holy Spirit, please help people to see. 
Why have you forsaken me? He's never felt this before. He's not, he's not cursing. You notice that? It's not like he all of a sudden got into his flesh, even though his flesh was pure. It's not all of a sudden he reverted. Well, fine then. If you're going to do this to me, Father, then I'm, okay, fine then. I wish I wouldn't have even done it. Now I'm mad. Now I don't want to go through with it. I think I will take myself down off this cross. Well, I think, you know what, like them guys in the garden, whenever they came to get me and they said, who, he, I said, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And I said, I am. And they all fell down. And then I, then I told them, don't you know that I could call down a legion of angels from my father? I might just call one down now, father, if that's how you're going to be, if you're going to turn your back on me like that, and I'm not going to be able to feel your presence. Isn't that how we get sometimes when people do us, when we feel like people have done us dirty, when we don't always completely understand exactly what's going on? Can I tell you that sometimes, too, whenever we're in those situations, God's actually doing something, he's preparing something? Um, think about that the next time. Lord, help us. That's, see, that's what, that, look, I'm, I'm going off on rabbit trails now, but that's the whole pro concept of Proverbs. Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. To begin to understand that when I put the knowledge of God in me and I begin to apply that knowledge, it becomes wisdom. Next thing you know, I become so skilled at the word of God by his grace that I start to have understanding. And I realize that when I find myself in a situation and there's a circumstance that's taking place, I have to start believing that God is, it, listen, there's nothing that can happen in the life of the believer that God's not allowing. So if he's allowing it, and I might not even understand it, I might have to travel this road long enough to where I may not even see the end results of it. Abraham never saw the people of God in the promised land, but he journeyed with God believing that God was going to do it. As we've been talking about prayer recently, I was, we were, I was talking to Aaron about some various people, men of God that prayed in the past. There's a lot of people in the past that were very famous for praying. And you may not be interested in that, but again, I'm interested in any true believer that lived before me. Dude, this is so beautiful. God's just been showing me. Do you understand that there is a true people of God that have lived on the earth and there's a cloud of witnesses that have gone before you and I and that we have a connection to them because we are the people of God and the rest of society is not the people of God. It's not that they can't be, but if you have not, if you're not a person of faith to believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that ultimately gave this world Jesus, then you are not a believer of the God that I serve. And so God is saying, uh, still, he's, he's, I want you to know he's still talking to the Lord, I was going to say about this, this guy in prayer, John Knox, is what he was in the 1500s, and it's, it's kind of like hard to listen to because it was 45 minutes of them just reading things that he was saying about prayer, but boy, every now and then I was getting like really hit by it. But they say, I think this is the right guy, that when he died, they found two grooves in the hard floor of his house next to his bed. And what they say was that that was from his knees. That was from his knees from years of prayer at the side of his bed as he spent time in the presence of the Lord. And, and one of the things that they said about him was that he had a son, two sons that both lived to 91. And one of his sons didn't get saved till he was 91. Now, I mean, think about that. That ought to put some stuff in context for you. Because here's a man that's praying so much he got grooves on the side of his bed. And his son didn't get saved till he was 91. Now, you think for one second that that brother wasn't praying for his family? And look, year after year, day after day, his son still ain't given in to the Lord. Did he quit? No. He just made deeper ruts in the floor. He just prayed harder. He just kept, he just kept trusting and believing God. And, there's, and surely as a man, there's times whenever we begin to question like, like, I mean, I can't really question that much. I've spent some time in prayer, but I ain't spent no time like that. And yet still, sometimes I find myself questioning. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. Help me. Because I ain't praying enough. I need to pray more. And to continue to trust God and to believe God. Amen. He's still talking to God is my point right here. Jesus is still talking to the Father. You might, I may not understand it. I don't understand why, you, why you've turned your face away from me, but I, why have you turned your face away from me, Father? See, to me, this is encouraging. 
This is encouraging because Jesus is still talking to the Father, even though at that moment he cannot feel the Father's presence. He knows that he's still there. Amen. Amen. Look in John chapter 19, verse 28. John 19 and 28. It says this, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, in parentheses, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. Now, the scripture that it's talking about is actually Psalm 69, 21. I'm going to go ahead and go there real quick. They gave me poison for food, and my, for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. So Jesus says, I thirst, and he remembers this prophecy, and he remembers that this was speaking of the suffering Messiah, and, he's, and I'm pretty sure his lips are parched, and he asks them to give him something to drink, and the end result is that they give him bitter wine to drink. And you know, I think about the fact that Jesus is actually drinking right then and there. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that this hit me for the first time ever. And this may not be a big deal to you, but to me, I thought to myself about when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying to the Father, and he's sweating blood, right, because he's so full of, his body's being stressed because the weight of the world is on him. And he says, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but your will be done. Now, there's a whole lot of Jewish context in there because they say whenever they would do a Passover meal that the last thing they would have a cup to drink. And many people have talked about the fact that he drank the last cup in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I don't have necessarily a spiritual problem with that. But what I'm realizing now is that he's actually literally drinking the cup of death and bitterness right here while he's on the cross. He's literally drinking the bitter cup of Psalm 69, verse 21. So my point to you is this, is that he's only concerned about the Father's will. At that point in time in his life, he's only concerned about the Father's will. He said that. He said, it is my meat to do my Father's will. Amen. So I just want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, and look, sometimes you're going to face situations and you're not going to understand everything. It's not going to always make sense. Amen. But the people of God, our call is to do the Father's will. Our call is to see people that are lost saved. Our call is to see people that are sick healed. Our call is to see people that are hurting to be touched by the, by the master's hand. Amen? Amen? John 19 and 30. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. In Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Then Jesus calling out with a loud voice said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. I was thinking about this right here, about I put the word faith right here as a fruit of the spirit. The word faith, because, and, and look, this was deep for me too. As I'm laying in the bed and I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking Jesus did everything for me. And what I mean is, if the Lord tarries and we don't, I guess I got kicked off. If the Lord tarries and we uh, don't go up in the rapture, there's going to be a day when Matt Abair is going to have to be able to trust God. There's going to be a day when I, as a man, am going to breathe my last breath. And can you, can you get us off of channel two and maybe put the scripture up on there? Because it looks like it's, it's not working right. Um, and whenever you get it up there, I'll tell you which scripture. So there's going to come a day when each and every one of us, should the Lord tarry, are going to have to breathe our last breath. And Jesus, I'm realizing, he went before me and he did it first. And he said it right here. He said, Father, Luke 23 and 46, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands, 
I commit my spirit. He was about to cross over. Now listen, I don't know how soon this was after he didn't feel the presence of the Father anymore. That's kind of a big deal. I never thought about that before. I know I'm getting kind of deep, but look, I never thought about that before. One statement he makes, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then another statement that he makes, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Whether or not I feel your presence at this moment in time, it's a faith. It's faith that I'm about to cross over and that I have done what it is that you've asked me to do and I have served you with my life. And for you and I, 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 Crossed over for us, amen. The good news is, is that he rose again, so he also showed us that, that there's hope. Amen. And then in Luke 23 and 43, the thief says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. We're going to close with a song. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. What a, what a beautiful thought, huh? What a beautiful thought that all, all of this not the whole thing. The whole thing was orchestrated by God the Father in eons past in order for Jesus to be able to die for the sins of the whole world. But how thoughtful of God the Father to have this thief placed right there on the side of Jesus to give one last soul hope. Amen. Right at that last moment of time. It just goes to show. You know, listen, I, I, I'm always careful about... Uh, I'm always, I try to be careful about not lifting up people too much, but I will say this, the Bible talks about giving honor where honors do. And what I saw in this is that Jesus was working for the Father to the very end. <laughs> he was enduring until the very end. And again, I'm not trying to make, but it's a big deal. I was watching Brother Kirk the other night after, after service and most of y'all had left and I went to go grab a ladder out of there because Danielle had asked me to grab this ladder and I look over here and there's a crowd of people and they just praying for people's healings, for people to be touched in their body. Amen. And, and like, look, look, the work of God never ends. Amen. The work of God never ends. Let us be about our father's business. And you know, at some point in time in the midst of all of this, the thief realized something else was going on. Isn't that beautiful? Whenever you and I can get a spiritual revelation that something else is going on and that it's not just what we thought it was, but that God is actually intervening. And for him, his worst day became the right place at the right time. I was thinking about that song. I put it in my notes. Oh, happy day. <laughs> oh, happy day. When Jesus washed my sins away. Have you ever had your happy day? Glory to God. The worst day can become the best day. Amen. Let's give the Lord some time. Amen. If you need prayer, I want you to know the altars are open.